You've been waiting all week for that Saturday show. Tune in, see what happened, let your troubles go. Work real hard, now it's time to take it slow. Kick back and relax with that Saturday show. From Studio 519 in beautiful downtown Albuquerque. Good morning, good morning, Albuquerque. And welcome to that Saturday show. I'm Jim Harvey, your host, and joined this morning by our director, Tom Dent. All I've got to say is, it's spring. It's 80 degrees today. <laughs> I get excited. This is my favorite time of year. Yes, it is. So let's just jump right into it. I am so excited because last week, we had the dedication of the Breonna Taylor mural at the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice. And what a beautiful mural it is. I'm just hoping that it goes viral. And hopefully people around the country and around the world will see this beautiful work of, uh, uh, work of art and this beautiful tribute to two women who were murdered by police. Speaking of which, the George Floyd trial is going on. And it's been going on all week now. And one of the commentators that I listened to one morning said that in the first couple of days, the, the um, testimonies were so impactful that even one of the jurors, when they stopped for a break, had to run out of the room because she was just stressed by the, the impact of the testimony. Let's hope that this trial goes well and that George Floyd's family and the nation gets the justice we deserve. And that officer needs to be tried to the full extent of the law. Okay. So, Tom, have you been keeping an eye on the marijuana bill? A little bit. I know when uh, at the end, of, uh, uh, the, la the end of the legislative session it turned into a mess. It was uh, stonewalled by the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, a lot of uh, what was proposed in it, the, the, the more modern stuff, uh, seemed to disintegrate. And as you probably know, the uh, governor called for a special session on Tuesday and Wednesday, and the last thing I heard was it was almost reverting back to last year's bill, and it was kind of a mess. And if they do sign it into law, it's, a lot of people think it's going to take two, maybe four sessions down the road to iron out all the kinks. Wow. Let's keep an eye on that bill. Let's see what happens. Okay. We'll keep an eye on that and see what happens then. Well, one of the good pieces of news is that uh, that ship in the Suez Canal got unstuck. And I know we're all happy about that. In fact, I have a friend who said he ordered a camera from some other country. And every time he hears about the news about the ship, he says, my camera is on that ship. <laughs> so let's hope he's right. <laughs> Let's well, just hope he's right. Let's hope it gets unclogged. Yeah, it is unclogged. It, it, it's a mess. It's like, what, one-third of the world shipping that got... One-third of the world shipping stuck on one ship. Can you believe it? Mm. All right, let's do a, a few little news clips here to just bring you up to date on some things. Good news again in New Mexico. COVID numbers continue to be low, and they are only low for two reasons. One, vaccinations are up. And two, we continue to wear our masks, social distance, and wash our hands. That doesn't change. We've got to continue to do that in order to keep those numbers down. We've got to do that. The ever interesting uh, development is that Diane Gibson, city councilor for District 7, has announced that she is not going to run for re-election. Can we say Emily DeAngelis? Emily DeAngelis is a woman who has already indicated that she intends to run for Diane's seat. Now, District 7, have we got a map of that someplace? Mm -hmm. Is it up? Yep. There it is, yes. So I used to live in District 7, I did, and that's over by the Jerry Klein tennis courts. Louisiana and, and Constitution and, and in that and area. The, and the malls, yeah. And the mall is in there, and yeah. So it's, it's really an interesting uh, mix of, of uh, uh, great housing and lots of commercial stuff. 
So we're excited. And so someone asked um, Emily DeAngelis about this, and she said that uh, even though she has uh, given, Diane has given eight years of service to the city, she's grateful for her dedication, and Emily is excited to be running to fill that seat. So let's keep an eye on that. Um, Joe Biden has done us all a solid. He's extended the eviction moratorium until the end of June. Let's hope he just keeps on extending it because we're not out of the woods in terms of that. And we've got to do everything we possibly can to try and keep people in their houses. There's too much homelessness out here already. And we have to do everything we possibly can in order to keep people in their homes. Um, so, eviction extends to the end of uh, June, and we can thank Joe Biden for that. Also, I know that earlier in the week he did have a great news conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he unveiled his uh, $2.2 trillion infrastructure bill. And he laid down a solid and heavy case for how we can do a lot better in terms of investing in the infrastructure in this country. 45,000 bridges, 4,500 bridges alone around the country that are falling apart. We've just got to get on this case. All right. So let's go back and take a look because we want to share with you some clips from the uh, dedication of the mural. Um, yeah, we want, to we want to share some clips, dedication to that mural uh, that we did at the uh, Center for Peace and Justice last Saturday. And what you're going to get is you're going to um, hear from the artist, Nana Bachacon, and then Siobhan Watson was our youth speaker for the day, Karen, Jones Meadows, who is just an incredible writer and actress, uh, did a reading from a book she's working on about Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. And um, we think we'll, you'll like what we give you here. That, that's a powerful reading. It was very a, powerful reading. Very powerful ceremony. Yeah. So let's go to that dedication. Um thinking anything else in the world other than the moment that I was in. And what strikes me is that black and brown women uh, across this nation are murdered at alarming rates beyond any other ethnicity. Um, we need to recognize that because if we don't recognize it, it keeps happening. Um, I chose the language of this mural to include radicalism. My dad is a longtime activist, and he brought me up with the understanding that we live in this nation and our identity is political. Our identity as brown people is radical. And until we are acknowledged as that, we cannot, we cannot exist in, in, in a realm beyond that. And I think that that implements my politics and that implements the way that I I've seen in the world and that people see me. Um, I think it's time that we acknowledge radicalism, that we acknowledge uh, what is actually happening in order for things to change and to call it as it is. As an African woman, female myself, it is hard to find encouragement and to be appreciated for all the hard work we do. I figured I would like to share some positivity to you all. As a, you join me as I admire the beautiful, powerful black women. Black is, black is beautiful, black is patient, black is kind. Black is love, ages like fine wine. Black is me, black is you, black is brilliant. Appreciation is far overdue. Black is coffee, I don't eat cream or sugar. I'm sorry you don't like the taste. Black is berries. Black is sweet, black is unique. Black is beautiful, black is powerful, resilient female of the African descent with skin kissed by the sun. 
Black is heaven sent, strong and a beautiful canvas that no one else can paint. Black is an already alluring illusion that everybody wants to see. Black is the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Black is the darker the flesh, the deeper the roots. Black is lift every voice and sing. Black is let everybody melodies ring. Black is finding the stars and possibility. Black is me, black is beautiful, and black is you. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, he stated, I come here today to plead to you and to believe in yourself that you are somebody. I said to a group yesterday that nobody can take this from us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Johnson Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into his inner resources and sign his soul with their own pen and paper. Don't let everybody take your manhood. Be proud of our heritage. We don't have to be ashamed of it. Somebody said a lie to us one day. They couched it in our language. They made everything black, ugly, evil. Look in your dictionary. You will always see the word black, ugly, and evil. Look at the word white. It's always something pure, high, and clean. But I want to make the language right today. I want to make the language right so right that everybody will cry out, yes, I am black, and yes, I am beautiful. Yes, I am proud, and yes, I am beautiful. Thank you. I'm sharing from a novel that I'm writing, Harriet Tubman and the Ancestral Posse. There's a haze, and there's a hum. Everyone sees it, everyone hears it, Everyone goes about their morning prep, hoping it will go away like most inexplicable occurrences that stir the soul. The first store owner unlocks his protective metal gate and sends it rattling up. A succession of others follow, producing a clanking community song announcing it's dawn and a little safer now. Daybreak sun glistens on rancid trash, broken glass, spent needles and useless appliances discarded on sidewalks and in lots and alleyways between dilapidated brown, beige, and red tenements. This same light nurtures blooming gardens tucked behind high fences, the first preemptive strike of gentrifying intruders securing newly renovated brownstones well from the others. To some people's delight and many's annoyance, Jimbe and conga drummers inside apartments, soloing on stoops, clustered on park benches, and perched at subway entrances, play motherland beats, syncopating the fast and slow-paced movements of African-descended people, from movers and shakers to the helpless, tending their day-to-day ghetto-influenced lives. On the boulevard, music from vehicles and stores mingle. Cabs threaten crossing, dashing, jerking pedestrians, trying to negotiate, create a lane traffic. Check cashing joints flourish by keeping 20% of each can't get a bank account wage earners salary. Korean owned produce stands thrive with loyal, never been out of the neighborhood customers. More gates are lifted. Afrocentrically attired street vendors flaunt kinterclock draped tables topped with burning coils of fragrant incense, tantalizing passers-by into listening to their proclamations of their unique wares. Bus stop shelves, bus stop shelters brim with anxious to get their passengers. Final call newspaper hawkers approach sisters and brothers with the message. Young and old folks pull carts of laundry, groceries, recyclables, and possessions left in the aftermath of eviction. Barbershop lines extend onto sidewalks. Fighting dogs have to be sidesteps. Courtships flourish among every age and ilk. Hustlers hustle. Healthcare workers usher the ill and recovered in and out of clinics. And among these lives, in varying degrees of solidity, are ancestors, mostly African, wholly or in part. The latter, a resilient group of people, some say, a new race. Ancient mathematicians, warriors, healers, farmers, griots, musicians, 
merchants, enslaved field workers, scholars, uniformed soldiers from the revolutionary to current undeclared wars and occupations, scientists, domestic workers, artists, recently dead male and female youth, intermixed with the living, some quietly, others shouting, waving, trying to break free. Free, Emmett Till, Crispus Addis, Aaliyah, Ossie Davis, Septima Clark, John Lewis, Frank Harris, you know, Uncle Frank. Amid the flurry of these lives, ascend whispered, Harriet, Harriet here, Harriet Tubman, help, Harriet, please, Harriet. Prayers, begs, beseeches, cries, shouts, growls, whimpers, lift beyond Earth's atmosphere, past galaxies, nebulas, and supernovas, soft landing in an immense fluidic cushion of luminous, pearlized light resembling an aurora borealis where harmony, celebration, and answers live. Here, every request is scrutinized, given a perfect solution, encased in the shimmering protective substance and sent back to its originator to proceed, heed, and act upon as has been offered by the ancestors since the first human ship left Africa toward the oppressor's shores. On this auspicious day, there is a tipping point. The preponderance of recent appeals, increased deadly force, and seeming amnesia among those served has prompted the collective presence here and on the ground to devise a new tactic. The ancestors are journeying back in mass for one day. Plus, there's gonna be a big party. Not prone to subtlety, the ancestral posse's launch is a spectacular, glittery light show as they explode into complex formations, swishing through universes, diving into black holes, mimicking constellations, playing in moon craters, and African Sankara dancing across the Milky Way's arms. Instantaneously, they synchronize into a dazzling prism one millisecond before the Earth's magnetic field yanks them into an atmosphere of gravity, physically, and emotionally. Clustered as one while traveling the quiet cosmos, each posse member generates a human body and the sense is needed to complete their task. Closer to Earth, they hear, de dum, de dum, de dum, the ever emanating planetary pulsation, and they respond with a collective, de dum, de dum, de dum. The unified de-dums become an undertone for Torres straight islanders, Japanese taiko players, Italian bio-traditionalists, Lumbee Native Americans, healers, Celtic celebrants, Lithuanian table players, Nigerian master percussionists, and other world inhabitants sending a mighty drum and fuse welcome. Hovering above the Americas and the Caribbean, the posse configures into a massive rainbow arcing from the Atlantic to the Pacific oceans. From coast to coast, classical jazz, reggae, Afro-Latin, steel drums, native flute, bluegrass, salsa, opera, zydeco, R&B, hip hop, metal, country, and rap music blare, creating a harmonious blanket of grooves, further overtaking the de domes, pleas for help, extraneous conversations, and world drum welcoming. The haze and hum are now imperceptible behind the full blazing sun and neighborhood sounds. Practically in unison, the grounded ancestors turn and face up as ribbons of rainbow light cascade down, speckled with tiny glimmers, the eager posse on their way to Earth. was powerful. So Jim, do we have any good news this week? Well, I don't know, but you know what? Why don't we ask Hassani Olojimi with Good News News? Hello, and welcome to Good News News. I'm your correspondent, Hassani Olojimi, and I'm Gugu for Good News. Now, the goal of this segment is to inspire and uplift you, the viewer, with nothing but good news. Let's jump right in. Our first story reads like this. A little kindness goes a long way, and that's certainly true for one Canadian senior citizen who is getting a lot of mileage 
by handing out personalized thank you cards to long haul truck drivers. After viewing several news stories in which drivers detail some of the harsh realities of trucking during COVID-19, like not being allowed to use restrooms or being forced to stay in their cabs for long hours at a time after crossing the border. Beverly Perrin decided these unsung essential workers deserve some kudos. Beverly Perrin and her husband Dick, they begin to deliver batches between 75 to 100 personalized thank you cards every three to four weeks to a truck stop near their home. They have delivered up to a thousand cards. Each one of Beverly's notes contains the same message. Thank you so much for bringing supplies to our stores. Even though it's under harsh circumstances, take care, stay safe, and God bless you. Your very grateful senior, Beverly Perman. <laughs> now, Beverly told CBC News, my husband and I do service for people. I get more out of it than they get from me. Now, isn't that good news? People thinking of others, and especially truck drivers. If it wasn't for them, we'd be without. So, let's dive into our next story. This story is the best gift a friend could give another friend, and that's the gift of life. Now, can you imagine just completing a life-saving training course and then having to test out your new skills the next day? Well, let's dig deeper. Torielle Norwood was behind the wheel of her car when it was T-boned by a speeding driver. The crash hurled the car containing the 16-year-old and three passengers across someone's front yard where the car ran into a tree. Two of the passengers were unhurt and were able to get out of the car and Toriel was able to climb out of her window. But Toriel realized that her friend Ari Zara was still in the car. Simmons had hit her head on the rear passenger window, resulting in life-threatening uh, injuries. Toriel checked her vital signs, unable to detect a pulse. She immediately began employing CPR techniques that she had recently learned. Her instructor, Erica Miller, was both in awe and astonished by her student's stellar performance. She proudly stated that this is what every teacher dreams of, that somebody listens, pays attention, and learns something. When Ari Zara woke up in the hospital, she didn't remember the accident, but there's little doubt she'll ever forget the best friend who saved her life and paid attention in class. Now, isn't that... Good news. <laughs> now, in local news, <laughs> New Mexico United will play their first regular season home match in May. The team will take on Austin Bowl FC on May 15th. It's been a long time since we've been able to kick a ball in front of a New Mexico crowd, said the president of the United team. It means the world to be able to bring a spark of joy to families across this beautiful state. We are thrilled to welcome back fans on Saturday, May 15th at 15% capacity. Now, isn't that good news? All right, New Mexico, we're getting back on track. Let's keep our numbers low. Well, let me tell you a story about a farmer. You want to hear it? Well, here it goes. A farmer had a three-legged pig, and his neighbor asked him why the pig only had three legs. Well, I tell you, the farmer said, one day I was plowing my field and the tractor turned over and pinned me underneath. The pig ran for help. He saved my life. Oh, so that's how he lost his leg, said the neighbor. Hmm, no, no, no. My wife and I were sound asleep one night and the house caught on fire and the pig woke us up. He saved our lives. So the neighbor said, that's how the pig lost his leg. Hmm. No, 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 that's not it either. Well, the neighbor's now frustrated and says, well, how did the pig lose his leg? The farmer simply said, when you have a pig that good, you don't eat them all at once. <laughs> 
The best way to turn a frown upside down is to get Google for good news. I'm your correspondent, Hassani Olujini, and I'll see you next time on That Saturday Show with more good news. And welcome back. You're listening to That Saturday Show. I'm your host, Jim Harvey, and this show is a presentation of the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice. And with us today, we are honored to have with us the newly appointed Superintendent of Police Reform, Sylvester Stanley. Mr. Stanley, Director Stanley, welcome to that Saturday show. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. Good to have you with us. I'm glad, you know, I'm sure that your schedule is already filling up like crazy. So to take time to, to, to join us is quite an honor. So let me just ask you, just tell us a little bit about your, your background. You've got quite the background in, in policing and uh, share with our viewers uh, some of the high long, highlights or high points of your, your, your background there. Well, thank you, sir. <clears throat> I started uh, my uh, law enforcement career at the age of 17. I joined the military in 1974 and uh, went overseas, uh, did a little black market investigation, was a road MP. In uh, 1975, I moved to Fort Riley, Kansas as a road uh, military policeman. And 19, in 1976, I got out of the service and joined the Junction City, Kansas Police Department. Stayed there until 1981, late 81, early 82, where I was a lateral transfer to uh, Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department, where I stayed for 20 years, almost 21. Wow. I, uh, after retiring from the Sheriff's Department, I went to work at the Sled of Pueblo for a year. And then I took the chief job in Gallup, at the Gallup Police Department for three and a half years. Uh, went on to be a state park manager for a year, and since then I was a uh, police chief in Hickory, Apache uh, community in Dulce, and then made a second spin at a Sleda Police Department. So you asked me what has stood out in my career. I think what has really stood out in my career, I was successful enough to be police chief uh, four different times. Uh, Indian country as well as the city of Gallup. And, and in an area where we don't have uh, many African Americans, I, I think that's an honor. I've been real pleased with that. In 1989, I got elected to go to the FBI National Academy for three months in Washington, I mean, Quantico, Virginia. So I, I come, with all of that, I was able to come back here and uh, continue doing this. The coffee still smells good in the morning. <laughs> so I don't mind going to work. Uh, I, I I was able to, I even ran for sheriff a couple of times unsuccessful, but at the end of the day, you know, you meet a lot of people out on the campaign trail. And so it just sort of helps you out in whatever endeavor you were taking on. Yes, it would have been great to be sheriff, but you know, it just wasn't my deal. It wasn't my calling, I guess. So we tried it. We can say we tried it. And this opportunity came along. And uh, I'm excited about this. This is, a, this is a great thing. It's no secret. Anybody from the state of New Mexico know we have problems at the Albuquerque Police Department. That's why the Justice Department came in. We got some good men and women here. Unfortunately, when you work under the umbrella of the Justice Department, it's not just the one or two people who were causing that problem. It affects the whole department. I've been tasked with the uh, idea of helping reform the Albuquerque Police Department, uh, changing it. And I will do that, not solo, but along with the police chief, Chief Medina, and all the other deputy chiefs. It's a partnership thing. I have the task. I have the task of being responsible for that, making the necessary changes with our internal affairs, uh, investigations, and the training uh, division. But I plan on being, I'm a good team player, I believe. And I think uh, my abilities and experiences will uh, assist me on assisting the police department and the other players 
that set the table where we can all be successful at the end of the day. I might just wrap up by adding and saying you know, I'm a retired first sergeant from the Army. From the, you know, I end up spending my last 20 years in the Army Reserve after three and a half years of active duty. But I think that leadership in the military also assists me in being the person I am today and it will allow me to complete the task that I have at hand. Well, I want to say thank you for your service, but after listening to that long and very impressive resume that, you know, has done nothing more than contribute, you know, to a, a, a litany of, of, of experience that you've gathered along the way, you know, I got to say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really excited about the role you're in because, yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of reform that's got to happen here. And I think the police department is going to be uh, a lot better off with you in this role. So, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I think Albuquerque is lucky to have Thank you. Thank you. Really lucky to have you here. So, in the few minutes we've we've got, would you want to share some of your your vision for how you're going to go about uh, dealing with these things? I know you've got the the whole issue of, of working with the uh, DOJ and, and, you know, they're constantly looking over everybody's shoulders and they've been here for a pretty long time themselves. So, um, you know, with you coming in, I know that you've got an idea in terms of how you want to approach the, the much needed reform here. Well, yes, sir. I mean, you're right. They've been here a while, the DOJ and the monitors have been assigned uh, obviously, I want to address this in a professional manner uh, for the best interest of the Albuquerque Police Department. But I'm also, you know, fairness. First of all, we're going to be professional about whatever we do. Uh, but we're going to be fair and honest and have integrity the whole way through this. And I say that to say because I'm also tasked with the final disciplinary action with the internal fires cases. So they come up and I'm supposed to review these cases and I have the final say so on that disciplinary action. Uh, I, I just want to say I'm thankful for the mayor and his team for thinking outside of the box and deciding to split this up and go this direction. It can only help the city of Albuquerque. I thank Chief Medina because he had a buy into this when the mayor told him he was going to split up some of these duties, and Chief Medina agrees that this is the way to go. And we've known each other for a while, and I think we're going to have a good working relationship together. I would like, at the end of the day, when I leave here, my vision for this is when I leave, DOJ is on its way out the door. They're gone to leave the men and women here to continue doing their jobs for the city of Albuquerque. And then I can say, job well done. And then I can go on off to retirement. All right, I like that. I like that. Yeah, I know that, you know, the mayor's had some fits and starts with his uh, uh, crime reduction efforts. And, and you know, and, and I know that, you know, he's tried a lot of things, but bringing you in is, is, is certainly gonna be a plus, I know. And, and uh, you know, we just look at, at, at you know, Mayor Keller as, as someone who's willing to try, you know, anything that he, think is, that he thinks is going to uh, uh, make a difference. And, uh, you know, we appreciate him for that as well. Um, so have you um, identified any particular hot spots so far that, that you'd like to like zero in on and, and, and begin to work on, on, you know, turning things around? Well, yes, sir. I, you know, in a short period of time, I've been here, but one of the things, and, and, and I have a couple of great commanders appears to be in place in the uh, internal affairs. You know, we have two different internal affairs units. So the professional uh, development and the force side, but to make sure our, the men and women that we have conducting those investigations, to make sure we're doing a complete investigation, uh, make sure we're interviewing all parties involved, witnesses, uh, offenders, or who have you, bystanders, uh, make sure we're getting complete statements, 
And, you know, being an old investigator myself, sometimes we have to get away from that desk to get out, to get a complete picture. So I understand that that's one of the areas we're going to work on, along with the uh, commanders in place. The other place I have to work on, and it's been brought to my attention, we're in the process of dealing with it, is the training academy and advanced training. Uh, I plan to spend at least one day a week out at the training academy, uh, meeting with that staff, working with the personnel out there so we can improve the training. You know, a lot of the stuff that we're missing or that we need to correct is sort of minor. It's a big thing with the DOJ and the monitors, don't get me wrong, but I think it can be fixed in a very easy term. We have to have commanders willing to stand up and take that action when necessary and stand up and be a leader and lead the men and women that we have on those assignments. And I, those are the things that we want to jump on right away. That's good to hear. I'm glad you mentioned the academy because um, a few years ago, I was part of a team that that uh, did diversity training uh, at the academy, um, you know, on a regular basis. And, you know, and eventually, you know, that whole thing just went away and we never heard any more about whether diversity training was going to continue there or not. Uh, we were sort of disappointed, but, um, you know, I, so I, I just don't know what's, what's happening with that, but I know that that was something that was pretty essential. And we looked at this as a way to bring the community onto the front lines with, with fresh officers and give them, you know, a fresh perspective, a different perspective on, on uh, what goes on in communities and the diversity of the communities, the challenges of the communities, so that uh, they would approach policing uh, with a, a, you know, a different view, hopefully, than uh, maybe a lot of the seasoned, more hardened officers uh, tend to. And uh, we thought that we were doing a pretty good job. So we're just hoping that, you know, whatever it is you find at the academy that needs to happen you know, you're going to help make that happen as well. Well, thank you, sir. And I'm going to look into and see what happened with the diversity program that we once had and meeting with the staff and hopefully we can put that back in. You know, uh, we believe in community-based policing, which is working with the community and, and in step and having that partnership. I understand that. And we have to pass it on. And we got, a, you know, we graduated 45 uh, cadets last week or two weeks ago. And we're starting this morning, another 60 cadets in the class of training out there. So we're, we're constantly on the, on the recruiting uh, to get our numbers up. And we're hoping to have a couple of classes this fall. And so we got a lot of work to do. So my point is some of those shortcoming errors in the training department and the academy, we don't have a lot of time to get that corrected. We have to step on it because, as you can see, we're constantly having new recruits going through the academy. We want to make sure we've made the necessary correction so that the new recruit has the new training and don't have the same old hangups that we once had. Here, here's a here's a final a final question for you, and if you can answer this one now or a, a year from now, we'll give you a major prize for it, and that is. What is the problem with trying to find African American women to join the police force? Ooh, man, that is <laughs> tough. And, and gotcha. the reason I said that is tough because over my career, I've been trying to, and I I was successful for a while. You know, Bernalillo County Sheriff Department. Early on in the day, in the early eighties, we had uh, black females working for the sheriff's department. Right. Uh, I have reached out and personally reached out and recruited a couple, a couple more over the years. Uh, definitely wasn't able to get any black females to go to work in Indian country. Uh, but we're going to continue trying to get that. We're going to, I'm going to make it 
part of our goal for the department. We have somebody else assigned over the recruiting, but I will share my expertise and me personally, if I have to help that recruiting, I think we need to move that up. You know, I, I was blessed and had the opportunity to work with Bobby Foster, the late Bobby Foster, yes. the Burnley County Sheriff Department. He and I was partners uh, in violent crimes, uh, became great friends, uh, but I'm always constantly trying to recruit. Uh, I've been successful with a few men, but I have not been successful with women. But we have to do that. You're absolutely right. And you may be right. It may take me a year or so before I can have that complete answer for you. But it won't be because the lack of training or trying. Well, the community is better for having you in, in place. And uh, we thank you for taking this time to come on that Saturday show and, and, and share with us your views and, and, and your uh, your outlook for the future and just let you know that the community is standing with you and if there's anything we can do to help you along the way we stand right here at the ready for you so superintendent of police reform sylvester stanley thank you so much for joining us today and we wish you the absolute best thank you and thanks for having me as part of your show Great expectations for our, our beleaguered and troubled police department. Now, we started um, in our second episode here with history about the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice. So we're bringing you part two of our three-part series on the history of the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice. Take it away. I love that. Can I interrupt a second and bring in some other projects that these two women were involved with uh, that I'd like them to speak a little bit about? Uh, Maria, that would be uh, another side and the hotline, uh, as well as many other things, the archives, of course. And Cecilia, the women of Chavez. I mean, excuse me, the, William, the women of Juarez, which was something you were very involved with. So, lovely speak <laughs> yeah the women of what is so uh, yes so many people were, wanted to participate and see a way of um, helping and joining the efforts to counteract the violence against women that was happening just across the border so there were very many times when we would go on trips to um, support in solidarity to all the um, groups of women who were working in Juarez uh, against femicides. Um, so there were very many um, visits over there with very many people from our Albuquerque community, that's right. And a lot of support, again, from Albuquerque to Ciudad Juarez and Mexico. That was, um, that was a, a very uh, dear project, and I do want to believe that we were able to help, um, you know, <clears throat> the mothers and the relatives yeah, of the victims right, of femicides right. um, with our presence and with sometimes we would bring with us some things that, you know, could make life a little easier. And you brought yeah. some of the mothers to the Peace Center, right? Yeah, they, uh, we did invite some of the mothers to the Peace Center. They gave uh, presentations. And one year, they actually participated in the Marigold Parade. Uh, they were very impressed. And we had this big banner. So it was interesting to see this uh, connection, you know, because uh, the femicides was something that we would hear on this part of the about the femicides in this part of the world, but we uh, we not always had the opportunity to uh, directly participate, support, and and meet some of the women who were so fiercely fighting against um, violence against women. So yeah, very powerful for sure. <laughs> Maria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, um, we started um, another side, Truth in Military Recruiting, to, you know, 
as part of that, at that time, that really national movement that was happening to counter the messages of military recruiters in the schools. And um, we did, um, we passed a bill through the New Mexico legislature in 2009. I thought this is going to be my little, my last thing to do, you know, before I kind of get out of the uh, this work in New Mexico, and, and we successfully passed this bill to balance the messages of military recruiters to make sure that um, if there were military if there were military recruiters, there there had to be equal across the district. In other words, they couldn't you know prey on the kids in the South Valley, for example, and only military academies go up to the Northeast Heights, for example. So we we equalized, and if the college recruiters only came to campus once a year, then only then military recruiters could only come once a year. We passed in bipartisan support in both houses of the legislature and Bill Richardson was the governor. And we had phone banks, we had people, you know, we had uh, the Center for Law and Poverty, we had SWAP, we had city councilors, uh, principals, parents, all kinds of letter writing campaigns and, and phone banking to call the governor to sign the bill. And he instead let it die on the 40th day. And when uh, Senator Atisi Pino asked him why he let it die, uh, first he lied and he said that the public education department uh, opposed the bill, which wasn't true because we worked with the PED on drafting the bill. And then he said that the Department of Defense didn't want it to pass. So that's what's happening. So the country, you know, the DOD is watching even little New Mexico. Of course, the DOD is watching New Mexico. What am I saying? But they are. They knew what was going on in our state legislature, and they knew what we were trying to do. But we had tremendous success. We toured all around the state, um, notably with two veterans from the Iraq War, um, a young woman who uh, was a medic during the occupation, and then an older um, man, uh, so Tina Garnanez and uh, Tony Garcia were uh, our, our main speakers mostly, you know, she was 24 years old. He had been in for 24 years. Tony was a, a Marine. He was in the invasion force in Iraq um, and then, you know, had a change of heart. And they both, I mean, led our efforts all around the state of New Mexico, talked to thousands and thousands of kids, also um, in Indian country. Uh, Tina herself was uh, Navajo, or is Navajo, she's still alive. Tony Garcia left us on uh, Veterans Day, 2010. Um, but uh, we did some incredible work with the two of them and, and with many others also. Around. And we came up with the catalog, right, of alternatives for yes, students. We did. We yes, we and one of a high school student helped you to put it together. Yeah, we had a high school intern who did all the graphics, all the art. Um, and Annalisa Aguilar did the, the layout and all the computer design, you know, all the... Um, you know, graphic design. He did the art, but she kind of put it together, you know, graphically. And um, Connie Green helped to get it published. I mean, it was always a, a group effort with Veterans for Peace and at that time, Iraq Veterans Against the War. And I mean, it was an amazing um, collaborative effort that we had. Uh, Franz, you mentioned also the archives. For anyone who doesn't know, the Center for Southwest Research over at UNM has our archive. It has the archive for CARD, for Citizens for Alternatives to Radioactive Dumping, and it also has the Center for Peace and Justice archives. And it's so cool because, I mean, Franz gave the history of the 80s, you know, beginning in the 80s, but these ladies and many others have been doing this work obviously their whole lives and there's a lot of Dory Bunting's uh, papers are in there and you see these you know black and white Anya Freeze, these black and white um, photos of them they mostly started um, protesting the civil defense drills remember those where they said <laughs> Here's what you do if, if a nuclear bomb is heading toward your community. They were like, let's prepare to survive a nuclear bomb. Okay, get under the desk, you know, duck and cover, all that kind of garbage. And so they were protesting the ridiculousness of that and saying like, why don't we disarm instead? How about? And they were just amazing. Dory and Anya, I remember for sure in pictures and I'm sure there were others uh, that I'm just not thinking of right now. And so the records go back to the 1950s and uh, there's an online finding aid and you can see what's in there. And then you can just go, go to the library and just put your head in those archives for a while. It's just amazing. And I had the privilege of, of um, doing an internship there, a fellowship when I was in graduate school and putting together those archives. Did, uh, food, uh, did food, food not bombs and stop the war machine uh, become Pajola groups at that time? Um. I can't remember when Food Not Bombs became a member. Can you? 
it had to be sometime around 2003 because that would have been <laughs> when Stop the War Machine started or like 2002, you know. Right, right. Maybe, maybe they didn't become a group, a Pajola group uh, right away, but they had been operating already in Albuquerque and then later on from the Peace Center's little space, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, they didn't, uh, Food Not Bombs at least, didn't sign up right away, mm -hmm. but they've always been around. <laughs> With different people, right? <laughs> yes. Changing. Uh, yeah. How, how long has the food distribution on Saturday been going on? Oh, you'd have to talk with Molly about that exactly. I can't remember. Well, um, I, uh, I remember, me. wasn't it, um, Maria, what's his name? Marcus. Yes, Marcus. Oh, right, from Trinity House, yes. yes. Uh, I would say like 2006-ish, maybe? I, I would think maybe even a, a, a couple of years earlier, but something around that, so. yes. yes. In 2006, we um, we were in the um, we were in the state fair parade. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> had one of the best Trinity. times of my life that I can remember to this point with the Trinity House truck, the biodiesel truck. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. So that and I was driving it, and you were distributing bread from the back <laughs> of the truck, right? And we were throwing, we were running behind, and. Larry Cronin was inside the van handing food to me and I was running behind the truck in the street throwing oranges and loaves of, you know, naked loaves of bread to people and they were loving it. <laughs> it was great. That was great too. It was. Another one of those great things because really, all I, I mean, the way I see it, so many things happen just in a, a spontaneously. It was, there was, uh, I mean, there was a little bit of planning. There was a little bit of thinking about how things were going to happen or be done, but it was, uh, it was not necessarily, you know, structured in a way that was boring or anything like that. Everything was very spontaneous and it, <laughs> things would happen and they did happen. They did happen very well. And with a lot of people involved, a lot of people volunteering for, everything and anything <laughs> in the building outside of the building um yeah very powerful mm -hmm. and, uh, i mean the community like just the feeling of yes. solidarity and just like i mean even you know just you know to have like 300 people that you know would like you know lay down their life for you it was a pretty incredible time you know yeah. um all those years i mean the, the the 2000s i guess i really i would say i mean i left in 2011, but I would definitely say like that period of time after George Bush's, you know, appointment by the Supreme Court and then following that through that decade was just, I mean, just incredible, just incredible solidarity, incredible community, and uh, just amazing work. Thank you to our wonderful volunteer, Franz Daniels Thompson, and past directors at the Peace Center, Cecilia Chavez Beltran and Maria Santelli. Very insightful, Tom. Yeah, and you can see from that all the great outreach work that the Peace Center does. They talked about Pajola groups and groups in the community becoming members of the Peace Center. Uh, we need more members uh, uh, of the Peace Center. What, what we're around uh, uh, 200, 300 members right now. We have uh, 40 to 50 Pajola groups. We need people to join. We need people to volunteer. We need uh, uh, your, your support and your donations for what we're doing. You know, you know we've got a lot, a lot of stuff going on. We're looking to uh, uh, start a restorative justice center and, uh, uh, and, and a resource center there. So we, we, we need your support. We need your donations. We need you to go to abqpeaceandjustice.org, our website. Uh, go, to the, go to our PayPal account. Help us out there. We need volunteers for, for the TV station. Yes. We need, uh, if you want to intern, you want to know uh, sound, camera work, uh, um, contact us, contact the Peace Center, get, get involved. Uh, we're starting to, to market. We're getting a lot more uh, views on our uh, YouTube. We got like uh, almost 200 on one episode. We're advertising in the paper um, about every third Thursday. We're trying to get the word out. We want to get bumper stickers. Talk to your friends and neighbors. Talk to your Facebook friends. I mean, 
share our show on Facebook. Tell them to go to our YouTube channel to That Saturday Show ABQ. Get involved. Help us out. Uh, we need uh, better video and audio equipment. We probably need about $400 for that. If you want to help out uh, getting better quality on our show, uh, go to our website, go to our P PayPal account and help out. Uh, stop by the Peace Center, say hi, see what's going on. That's it. That's it. There's a lot that can happen here, and you can be a part of it. We want to be out in the street. We want to be in the community. We want to be with, in your organizations and, and make certain that we bring you into these discussions as well. There's a lot happening here, and you can be a part of it. We thank you for your time and your attention, and we want to now end our show with music by the absolutely fabulous Chloe Nixon. And I can't breathe, no, I can't breathe, no, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, my mama says keep your hands up, daddy says hood down pants up, you should be fine if you Till the next time, it's time to say goodbye. When you out here in the streets, keep it real, 505. We love everybody. We just want to let you know. Thanks for tuning in to that Saturday show.